1 Timothy 3 is commonly marked as the chapter that tells us about leaders in the church, the episcopacy and, and the deacons, or the bishops and the deacons. And if you were going to sit down and write this chapter, you're going to write down what are the requirements for such leaders, what might you include? Would you put in a job description? Would you put in some qualifications, duties, term of service, the process of testing who is qualified? Right? Is any of that in this chapter? Did you hear any of that? Was there a job description there? No, there really wasn't. Now, we may be able to make some assumptions that Paul had left a similar structure of elders running the church like he had grown up with in the synagogues, a group of elders taking care of the business. But it is striking to me that this chapter, which is devoted to, leader, to the leaders of the church, spends almost no time whatsoever talking about what those leaders should be, you know, doing. This is entirely focused on the character of the leaders, right? If, and if there was a, there's something going on at the church at Ephesus, and we don't know all the details, but the, the leaders are kind of fighting and uh, not in, in agreement, and, and like this might be the time for Paul to go over the basics of what being a leader means, and, and he, this might be a good opportunity to, to discuss all those things. But um, <clears throat> what Paul does is he focus, focuses on character. He doesn't tell them what to do. He doesn't give them detailed plans. He reminds them of who they are and of why they were chosen as leaders in the first place, that they had a certain character, and, and to spend this entire section uh, talking about that. <clears throat> As I was reading about this, I was reminded of a book. I had read, you know how you can go on Kindle and you can get the first chapter for free? I blatantly did this. John McCain wrote a book called Character is Destiny. And he's right. And the first chapter lays that out. I need to go back and buy the book and read the rest. But like, character is destiny. That's how it works. But if we have leaders of good character, there, we don't need any rules or laws to try to bind them because they're people of good character. Rules guide, but you don't really have to have them. And if we have leaders of poor character, well, there is no rule or law that can bind a leader of poor character. There will always be a way to squirrel around this. And it struck me that I am deeply, like, passionate about this because I've run into situations. There's one particular situation that, that like, to this day, bothers me about leadership in, in the church. Uh, back in, in when I was in seminary, so this is almost 20 years ago now, there was one particular person, I'm going to avoid all pronouns and names because I'm not telling you anymore, but there was a person who was very popular. Everyone wanted to be around this person and, and life of the party. We didn't party often. There was one party a semester at seminary because after the, the first two weeks, you had your one party, then you had to study forever. Uh, and uh, 20 years, 18, 20 years ago now, it was rumored that this person may not have been straight. It's Methodism, it's 20 years ago, I'm in the South. This was a big deal, a really big deal. And I don't know anything about this person's uh, sexuality, but some people are really uptight, like this person should not be a pastor because of their sexuality. Now, I am glad this person is not a pastor and has nothing to do with their sexuality. It is because I sat down with this person, we were writing a paper. Uh, you have to study to be a, pa a Methodist pastor. You have to study Bible, theology, ethics, Methodism, uh, history, all that. And uh, so we're writing a paper that you completely ex expect us to have to write. Who is Jesus? A good question. And, and so we're learning the theology of it and, and how that, what in the first two centuries, how is that like figured out? Who do we say that Jesus is? And, and I'm struggling with this because I, I am, I have to get it right. Like this matters. If, if you ask me who Jesus is and I can't tell you who Jesus is plainly, we have a problem. So I am struggling with this to make sure I, I get it right because it is a matter of salvation. And, and this person looks at me like, Andy, why are you up, uptight about this? I, I'm, I'm, what this person told me was going to write what the, the professor wanted to, to hear, and that was that. Turn it in, get your A, move on. And I looked at this person and said, so you're, you're what? You're, this person lied. 
in a paper about who Jesus is. I don't care about the gender, the sexuality. The person lied, and that person is not a pastor. Thank God, right? And I mean that very sincerely. Uh, because what type of leader, what in the church can a person who's willing to lie be? Like I said, uh, John Maxwell writes about how leadership works, and he points out that uh, you can only attract leaders who are like you. And this is true, right? Leaders who are honest, who are forthright, who are vulnerable about what they are, are bad at, but willing to learn. Like, you can attract other leaders, both, both type of leaders gather together. But if you have leaders who are willing to lie about what matters, who, who's going to follow such a person? John Maxwell further points out that uh, leadership is based upon, first, your position. you got to do what Andy says because he's the pastor. I hope we're long past that. I don't want anyone to do what I say because I'm the pastor. I hope that we've gotten to the point where if Andy says it, I know Andy and I trust him and I think we should do it because I respect him. Like, and if we're not there by now, then we have a problem, right? But again, that's a matter of character. When it comes to leadership, character is everything. And that was Paul's laying out here. <clears throat> So Paul, uh, and before we go into like the exact details of what Paul says, I think it's worth noting that neither Paul nor Timothy could have met the standards that they lay out here, like because they say should be a husband of one wife, and Paul and Timothy, neither of them were married. And so I doubt that Paul was trying to write down a list that would disqualify him from, him from being a leader in the church. Well, what I, so I think what we should, the way we should read this is this is sort of describing a general character. It's not creating a checklist. So this, what, what, what does Paul write? Paul writes that a bishop must be above reproach, married only once, temperate, sensible, respectable, hospitable. Married only once. We don't know if that means like married one at a time, like maybe married and then a spouse dies and remarried, or, or it, it could be married once ever. We don't know, but it does seem to get at the sense of not having multiple wives and a mistress on the side. Don't be polygamous, right? Keep, keep the family in good repute. Um, past, uh, bishop should be temperate, sensible, respectable. Be people who can handle decisions without ignoring emotions and without getting wrapped up in them. Be hospitable. The elder, the, the bishop, is the one who is going to offer and lead the people in offering hospitality to people traveling through. The bishop must be an apt teacher. This is the, one of the only indications we have about what a bishop does, is a bishop must teach to a certain degree. The bishop should not be a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. There's nothing worse than a leader who's itching for a fight. It just goes poorly, doesn't it? He must manage his own household, keeping his children submissive and respectful in every way. For if someone does not know how to manage his, his own household, how can he take care of God's church? For years, when I asked if I was going to have children, I would joke back and say, I don't need children, I have two churches. And uh, there is some truth to that. Uh, the church... And a family, a church is a family, and to be able to lead your family well and to be able to lead a church well, it, it, it's similar. Like, we don't go as far as some churches do and say, uh, call each other brother, sister, uh, brother so-and-so, or sister so-and-so. And, and it's part of that same um, logic that you end up calling the, the leader of the church father. And you could call me Father Andy, but I, I don't know if I would answer. I'd, I'd probably be confused by that. But you could. Warn me. Uh, he must not be a recent convert, or he may be puffed up with conceit and fall into condemnation. Must not be a recent convert, because how long does it take to know someone's character? You don't know it the first time you have coffee. Right? You, you gotta, it takes time. He must, moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he might not fall into disgrace in the snare of the devil. Yes, it is an interesting challenge here. Like, the church is the place where everyone is given a second chance. And in this particular situation, when if your neighbor reports you to the cops for being Christian, you'll be killed, it probably is a good idea to make sure your leaders are well respected so that you have, can have someone to show up and say, seriously, chill, we're, we're not a problem. D. 
deacons likewise must be serious, not double-tongued, not indulging in wine, not greedy for money. Notice that it doesn't say, like, it says deacons plural, where it said bishop singular. So this is an indication that there were more deacons than there were bishops. Okay. Uh, and deacons, they don't have to be good teachers. It doesn't say be a good teacher. It says don't be double-tongued. You don't have to be well-spoken. You don't have to be able to speak in public to be a leader in the church. Just don't lie. Can we, let, that's a good baseline, right? A matter of to be trustworthy. Deacons must hold fast to the mystery of faith and let them be first tested. If they prove themselves blameless, let them serve as deacons. Like, bishops aren't tested because after you hang out with someone for years, you kind of know who they are. Deacons, Paul says, you might want to test them because if someone comes to you that's excited and, and new to the faith and really wants to get involved, you don't know them all that well, you're going to want to sit down and test them and say, okay, before we give you the, the sort of the blessing of the church, the impromptu like go forth and serve in the name of the church. Well, let's make sure that this is going to go well. Well, let's let's talk about this. Women likewise must be serious, not slanderers, but temperate, faithful in all things. Some people read this and believe Paul is creating a new position of deaconess. Others read it and say women are being deacon. I don't know. If you want my opinion on Paul and women, I refer you to last week's sermon, uh, and that's where I hashed that out. Let deacons be married only once. Let them manage their children and their households well. For those who serve as deacons gain a good standing from themselves and great boldness in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Now, what Paul has described here at two levels, having a bishop and deacons, that is not how we run the church today. Well, the way we run the church today, the leadership reflects what comes after. Like Paul writes this in 60 AD, and shortly thereafter, it goes from having a, a bishop or a few bishops and a lot of deacons. It goes to bishops, elders, and deacons, and goes to like three levels. If you want, also, if you want to call me by my official titer, title, I am an elder. I am neither a bishop nor am I a deacon. I am an elder, and, and you, so I could be called Elder Coon. Again, I would not respond. I'd be very confused. But, uh, so I don't think we need to look at this and try to recreate the model of the first church that Paul is working with here. Like something else developed in the church, it seems to work decently well. I think the, the importance is, is to see how much focus Paul puts on the character of the leadership. It, for it is the leaders that help maintain the character of, of the church. We've got to remember that. The church is the place where there are no requirements. Like, what, are there any requirements to walk into this room? None, right? Walk in this room. You are welcome. That's how it is. That is how it is always is. This table is always open. Christ invites to his table all who love him, seek to be at peace with him, and confess their sins. Like, this is the, how this works. This is an open table, an open congregation. All are welcome. And it is the leaders who are entrusted to maintain that. And so it is an odd thing that there are requirements for leaders to make sure that there are not requirements for what it takes to get in this room. Because it, it is easy for a group to go astray and say, well, there should be requirements to be here. And it's the leaders who say, no, there are never requirements to be in this room. The requirements are walk in the door. That's it, right? So the way Paul wraps this up, is he's addressing the situation that's oddly parallel to where we are today. Paul writes to a church that is before Christendom. And Christendom is the name for this time, when, for centuries really, when the church and the state work together really well. Or maybe they don't work together so well. That's actually kind of a complicated topic. The point being, at this point, the church and the state have nothing to do with each other. The church is, is over here trying to stay off the radar of Rome. And, and, and after this, the Christendom happens where popes are crowning kings and this whole long story. And we've come out on the other side of that. And Christendom kind of died. About the 1960s, and we've hit this point where the church is sort of off, is just not, does not have the cultural pull that it once had in Christendom. It just doesn't exist. Like, 
it is not a given that everyone, every family in the community is going to be involved in a, actively involved in a church. And, and so the advice that Paul wraps up with is oddly fitting, again. Well, because what Paul writes is that the church is to be a pillar in a bulwark. <clears throat> a pillar in a bulwark of the truth. A pillar lifts up what is good, and a bulwark holds back what is bad, if you think about it. Right? So the church is the pillar of holding up, this is what leadership looks like. And it was a bulwark that pushes off a defensive line, that pushes off that which is not in line with this. And I lament that it is the case that we can no longer assume that if you are a business leader or a political leader or a leader of any stripe, really, we can no longer assume that if you are a leader in America, that you are a part of a church where you are showing up and confessing and forgiving and hearing the good news of Jesus Christ on a weekly basis. Like, we, that's just not a given anymore. And, and so, in a similar way to the first century, the, the role of the church today when it comes to leaders is to lift up the importance and centrality of character. Character is everything when it comes to a leader. We lift that up as a pillar, and we're a bulwark to fend off anyone who would say differently. This is what leadership following Jesus looks like. We are here to live it each and every day. Amen.